Okay, as you all know, a patent ductus arteriosus is found, is a vascular structure is found in all of the mammalian fetuses, and it's composed of longitudinally and spirally arranged layers of smooth muscle fibers, which in loose concentric layers of elastic tissue, and the amount of smooth muscle in the medial layer is increased compared to the neighbors to pulmonary artery and aorta. And as you, again, you all know that almost 60-65% of the combined ventricular output crosses from the PDA, from the PA to the descending aorta. The reason the PDA is open is because of the low of partial oxygen concentration in the fetus and also increased concentrations of PGE2 and PGIY, which, is, which are produced by the placenta. So after delivery, the partial oxygen concentration in the blood goes up, and since the placenta is not functioning anymore, the, the, the concentrations of the prostaglandins are down, so what we call the functional closure starts. And that's usually within 12 hours. And the anatomical closure is usually expected around three weeks with the fibrosis of the muscle layers. In some patients, the anatomic closure never happens, and this is sometimes very helpful, as you will see in the next slides. So why do we need a PDA open? We need a PDA open in, as all you know, a PDA-dependent pulmonary circulation, like in patients with pulmonary atresia, or critical pulmonary stenosis, or in the neonatal, severe neonatal Epstein's anomaly, where you have the functional pulmonary atresia, or in systemic circulation, as we all know about hypoplastic left heart syndrome or multiple left-sided obstructive lesions, the variants of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. In all these two situations, you may have a well-developed two ventricles, or you may have a borderline ventricle, or you may have a single ventricle. There is a third way, I mean, uh, there is a third one that we need, we may need a PDA open is actually in the idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension that was talked about yesterday. And some of these patients, if you have a PDA, it's, it's, all, it's either a small PDA or, or a probe PDA, which is not really there, actually. When you look at the echo, it acts like a sunshine, and it's actually better for the RV decompression in these patients compared to creating an AST, which is not the scope of the point today, but I will talk to you about it later if we have time. So I'll just go through that. So the main topic today is PDA-dependent pulmonary and systemic circulations, and we'll start with the pulmonary circulation first. And as you noticed, actually the types of PDAs are different in these two settings, so the techniques and uh, everything we do is, again, totally different. So in 1944, when the first blood shunt was performed, we started a new era in these patients with decreased pulmonary blood flow. And since then, it's been a mainstay of therapy in the patients with decreased pulmonary blood flow, either as primary palliations or as a bridge for total correction. So why do we do something different? Why do we start doing st uh, stents instead of this? Is it because we think the surgeons are, you know, getting, uh, I mean, getting much more money than we do and we want to get better cars? So can we steal some role from the surgeons? So can we become like a surgeon? No, of course that's not the case. It's because the rationality behind it is it's this invasive procedure and it can be done in most patients, even the patient is extubated. So that decreases the hospital stay and also the ICU stay a lot. And this decreases the number of surgical procedures for sure. And avoids complications secondary to thoracotomy and BT shunts. So it can be a good alternative to surgical and BT shunts to increase or, and maintain the pulmonary blood flow in selected patients. What about the complications of blood ectopsin shunt? There are a lot of complications, could be early and late complications in the past. Most of them we don't see today, actually. But we still have problems with BT shunts today, as the STC congenital heart surgery database pointed out. In the mortality rate of BT shunt is almost 7 to 8 percent, which is quite high, actually, because like even it's higher than the total repair of a TGA patient. So these, need, these patients need ventilated support for a long time usually, and especially if the patient is less than three kilos, or if the patient has pulmonary atresia and IV intact ventricular septum, these are the risks for uh, increased mortality risks. And um, if you specifically look at the mortality in 
pulmonary atresia in type 2 receptor is almost 16%, which is very high. And that type of patients are the best patients for the PDA stenting, and they benefit the most. So uh, that's how everything started with these patients, actually. Uh, it was like 1992 when Dr. Gibbs first started the PDA stenting, but however, that time, because of the technology of the stents and the catheters, the results were not good, so we abandoned that for a while. But again, uh, like in 2004, Dr. Gelling from Belgium actually represented good results with these patients. And then it was followed by Mazani Alvi and, and the group from uh, Germany, G Gissen. Uh, so we started to put stents in the PDA. It, it has had technical difficulties because of the differences in PDA morphology in these type of patients. And especially the, 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 the ductuses where the where tortuous vertical and long ductuses, it's not, it's not possible, if not impossible, to do that. And uh, you significantly have PA branch stenosis, which might be a problem for the PA growth. And also you can have significant complications, it may lead to death, actually, with it, like a PDA spasm, stent occlusion, and migrations. Another downside of it is it's kind of a short palliation time compared to VT shunt. And uh, even the best of all, you can get a six months. If you redilate and stuff like that, you can go up to one year. So it's kind of a short palliation time. So in terms of the ductus uh, morphology, the best one is the first, this is the elongated from the descending aorta, it's like a normal ductus, and we see that in the pulmonary atresia intact ventricular septum patients and also in uh, critical PS patients and it's transposition sometimes, which is the best ductus type that we can stand. And then the second one is, the, it's a more distally from the transfer sarcus, but with less than two bands. The third one, mostly seen in the VST pulmonary atresia and complex pulmonary atresia, and it's a longer and more tortuous uh, ductuses, which we are not usually able to do the stents. And you can also have from the subclavian atypical ductuses or even bilateral ductuses, which can be stented as an initial, initial palliation. So. The procedure can be done from the femoral artery or axillary artery on the carotid artery retrograde way. And that's most of the time is preferred when you have a narrow ductus at the pulmonary end, and which most of the time it is like this. And if you're gonna stent the patient with intact ventricular septum pulmonatresia before perforating the valve, or if this patient has bipartite or unipartite, severely hypoplastic right ventricle or RV-dependent coronary circulation that you're never gonna perforate the valve anyway. Or you can do it from the femoral vein, anterogrately, with the patients with critical PS, or uh, in patients with uh, intact ventricular septum and pulmonary atresia after the perforation and ballooning of the valve. Or in patients with VST and pulmonary atresia, you can go across the VST, and that gives you a better angle for the vertical PDAs in some cases, which I will talk about. In terms of the equipment, you will need all the you know, catheters that you have in the cat lab because you have different types of ductuses and different uh, morphologies, so you can try all these catheters, and you need four French and three French, actually, in small babies. Pick their catheters. You can cut them and make different shapes. And in terms of the advancing the stent, you usually need long sheets, and that the best ones are the cook flexo sheets. They come in four French and five French, and they have, uh, they are able to accommodate large stents, so which is good. And you, especially for the tortuous ones, you will need the support of an advancing sheets. And sometimes in very small babies, it's not, you know, you cannot put the sheets into these babies' femoral arteries. They're really small, so you just put it for friend sheet to the femoral artery, even the short sheet, you can just send the stent barely and you can do the controls from your femoral artery because the babies are small. You can either use white connectors for, to prevent bleeding and you know, guide wires and extra support wires are usually better and you, you, you will need coronary stent which you can easily find even if you're working in a hospital that you have adult colleagues with you. So it can be a primary treatment in critical PS and intact ventricular septum with pulmonary atresia, or in patients with Epstein anomalies in the newborn period with functional pulmonary atresia, because in all these cases, your small and non-compliant RV needs an additional pulmonary blood flow just for some time, maybe six months or three months, because then 
the, uh, the RV gets better, compliance gets better, and then you don't need the PDA anyway, and if it's closed, it's not a problem. You may have a cure on these patients. Or you can do that as an alternative to surgical MBT shunts in patients with all types of univentricular repair candidates with pulmonary stenosis, or in patients with VSD pulmonary with non confluent pulmonary arteries, just to buy time for the, conf for the surgeons to do the confluence. What about the two ventricles, like in patients with TGA, VSD, PS, or monotresia, it can have a role in there, actually, when I talk about it. And uh, again, other well-developed two ventricles. If you have an already integrated blood flow and you will need an extra blood flow, that can, you know, that can be used in two ventricle repairs also. But in tetralogy of follow-up pulmonotresia, I don't do that, actually. I, usually these patients, either I send them to surgery for a BT shunt or if they have a main pulmonary artery coming close to the heart, then we do a hybrid approach in the cat lab, actually, I mean, in the, in the OR, uh, where we don't go on the bypass and we just perforate the valve into, in the operating room and put a stent there. So you don't go on the bypass and it's, it's very nice RBO to reconstruction, which is uh, actually the patients are very happy and they can get excavated the next day or so. So just to show some examples, patients with, as I said, the critical pulmonary stenosis, IVS, PA, and Epstein's anomaly are the ideal ductus morphology for ductus stenting. So this is one patient with IVS pulmonary atresia. You see the ductus is almost closing. So you put a stent there and see how beautiful the stent. Uh, I mean, it's like a BT shunt. So you can do this. I mean, if the patient, uh, you can call back the patient a couple of months and as here you can see, you can do the perforation of the valve as well, and, and that's a good palliation, and at the same time, you can rewrite it to patent that to such a useful stand, so it can take you, it can give you another extra six months or so. For the univentricular repair candidates, as I said, it's a good option because you need only like four to six months for a gland operation, so I think that's a good alternative for a BT shunt, so you can decrease the, the uh, number of surgeries, and it's uh, a lot safer actually to do the stents. If you have a ductus, even though sometimes it looks it's very, very tiny, if you manipulate the guide wire for a while, if you're patient enough, you're usually able to go through it. And once you pass the wire, it's almost always possible to go uh, with, the, with the stent. And this is how it looks afterwards, after the stent. So it looks like a BT shunt, as I said. So, like this patient, we had a transposition ventricular septal defect PSD. The patient was cyanotic. We did a balloon atrial septostomy. The saturations went up a little bit, but we were not happy with the saturations. And then there was a small PDA, so we said, well, why don't we just go after the PDA and we can put, put a stent and so it's, it acts like a PDA, I mean, like a BT shunt. So that's how it looks after we did the stent in the PDA and the saturations went up and the patient were, you know, very happy with saturations with like low 80s after this procedure. So there is a way, I mean, there is a role of the PDA static in, even with two ventricle patients, as, as you can see here. And the patient with the non confident pulmonary artery is like this, with an atrial pulmonary ductus to the left pulmonary artery, and the right pulmonary artery is coming off from the descending aorta with some narrowing, so the, the, vascul the pulmonary vasculature is not affected. So you see the narrowing here. So we can go and put a stent there. It's usually more straightforward and easy compared to the other ductuses. But you have to be very careful. As you see, you can, uh, you shouldn't leave the PDA uh, unstented. So uh, we went ahead and put another stent in there just to make sure that we are okay. That's another patient that's a little late. The same, similar to this patient, a little older, but the PDA closed. So you kind of lost your left pulmonary artery. So what we did in this patient was we did a wedge injection and we thought there was a PA at the, there. So we negotiated the guide wire through it and we were able to go. We did a small coronary balloon first and just to make sure that we are, we are okay. And when we saw that there was a PDA afterwards and we go after it, we put a stand. And this is how it looks afterwards. So after two years, this patient, the surgeons were able to do the unifacalization and put a restrictive conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery and with the high saturations. Now he's waiting, hopefully, for the pulmonary arteries to grow and uh, may have a VSD closure and a bigger conduit replaced. This is before and after. 
So the most difficult ones are the vertical PDAs, and these PDAs are usually found in VSD and uh, tetralogy of fallow and VSD and, and, and pulmonary atresia patients. Some of these are less tortuous and they have less than two bands, and they are amenable for stent uh, placement, like this one. You can use a cut pigtail. It usually goes right into the PDA from the, if you want to go through the artery, and then you can just stent them, and it usually works really nice. The problem with these, they go for, you know, only six months or so, so you have to redilate these, or you have to put a bigger stent to start with, and sometimes they may cause problems with the increased pulmonary blood flow initially, so you may have to treat these patients with, uh, with diuretics and stuff like that, but it's worth it. And again, as I told you, you can sometimes, in these kind of patients, you can go sometimes from the uh, venous road to the VS, through the VS into the ascending airtime, and it makes an easier route for the stent and the guide wire to go. So that's another way to do it in the vertical PDAs. And also, I don't use it, but other people do that, more frequently with the vertical PDAs, they go from the axillary route or from the, uh, depending on where the PDA is, from the right axillary or left axillary or, or from the carotid right into the PAs. Um, and for that, I think you need a little bit more experience. Uh, maybe you can get help with the surgeons also. They can give you a cut down for the carotid artery. And uh, that, that, that's probably making things a lot easier in that type of that. So, Another important thing is the guide wire positioning in these patients because um, what we usually do is if there is no PA bifurcation stenosis and there is a main pulmonary artery, we just leave the guide wire in the main pulmonary artery. So that makes uh, the guide wire, I mean, that makes the stent uh, deliver equal blood flow to both pulmonary arteries. But if you have a stenosis of one of the pulmonary arteries, it is always better and advantageous if you can advance your guide wire to the stenotic PA, but it's not always easy and it's not always possible. But if you can do that, you have to do it because if you put a stent there, it's, it's gonna allow more flow to the stenotic pulmonary artery and so we'll get a better solution. Because if you don't do that, eventually you may not have a good pulmonary artery development in this, in this site. So, and sometimes you may do a pre-ballooning or, or, or you may put a balloon catheter first so you can, advance a more stiffer wire for the uh, stent to go in there. But these are little techniques that we may use it. So the complication, the, the major complication is the ductal spasm. It's terrible. I mean, if you have a ductal spasm and you're monoplink the duct ductus with a patient, the single and only pulmonary source is the PDA, it's, it's, it's very detrimental. So I usually actually don't stop the PDA during the procedure. Some people they say we should, we should stop it and say that, that, that the PDA should narrow a little bit. But I usually have the I mean, prostaglandin ready. And I, I had one patient, and it was really very catastrophic. So um, I try to use the PDA as, well as, as much as I can. If the PDA, if the P, if the PDA is very open, I, I'm widely open, then I may cut the uh, prostaglandin infusion right in the cat lab and wait for a while until the, the duct gets smaller. Stent migration is an issue, but it's not deadly. I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, it's usually manageable, and uh, you can sometimes get uh, get into the stent with another balloon, and you can manipulate the stent. Uh, it's not easy, but you can do something about it. And there's a, the risk of acute thrombosis. It's it's also rare, but it's it's uh, for this for to avoid that you you shouldn't wait too much in the PD. I mean, if as long as you, you just inflate the balloon and you don't you know, look around, I mean, you just take the balloon out, you just make, want to make sure you, you manipulate in the duct as, as little as, as possible. So I prepare everything beforehand and I don't wait, like waiting for the stent to be loaded and stuff like that when I'm in the PDA. So everything is ready. You just go put the wire in and then you do it right away. You don't, you know, wait. So that, that has to be quick. And ductus perforation is reported. I have not encountered that, but that's another problem if you're probably using too large of uh, P, uh, stents. And bleeding from the pulmonary arteries is always a problem. I mean, uh, from the femoral arteries might be a problem because these patients are going to be receiving heparin and stuff like that. And femoral artery injuries is just something you have to really be aware and careful and, you know, because these babies, most of the time, they are small babies and they have small femoral arteries, so you have to be very careful at that. 
and the instant stenosis is the major late complications. As you can see, there's significant proliferation, and the stents may get narrow very quickly, so you have to check them very, very often. And um, usually, until three months, there's no problem, but uh, you may see it narrowing after three months. I have seen patients going up to two years with the stents, uh, with uh, some kind of narrowings. And it's possible, but not easy, to redilate these, because if your stent is protruding into the aorta, and it is sometimes inevitable, then it is very hard to cross that again. So sometimes it may not be possible to do that. And another problem is the PA bifurcation, bifurcation stenosis because it may interfere with the PA growth. So if you have a surgeon and if he's going to do a reconstruction of the PA and is going to do a shunt in these patients, it might be a better option. But sometimes the, the, even the surgeons, they just put a shunt. So that, that's how, I mean, how your surgeon is going to behave. If, if they are willing to do um, pulmonary plasties, with the shunt, then I think it's a better option to, for these patients to have surgery. Again, redilatation is possible, especially in that type of practices where you don't have problems with protruding into the aorta. So what did the, the American Heart Association say about ductal stents in the PDA? I mean, uh, PDA-dependent pulmonary circulation, it's like a close to indication, for, and it's, it means it's reasonable to stent an anatomically suitable duct arteriosus in an infant with cyanotic congenital heart disease who has more than one source of pulmonary blood flow, which is the best candidates, as I said, like critical PSs and the IVC pulmonary atresia, and two ventricle patients who, uh, or, or, or univentricle patients with pulmonary stenosis, uh, and who requires additional pulmonary blood flow from the stented ductus for a relatively short period of time. In class two indication, it might be reasonable to stent an anatomically suitable PDA in an infant with cyanotic heart disease whose sole source of pulmonary blood flow is the like the patients with tetralogy and pulmonary atresia. So you have to be very careful, and it's like class two indication for these patients. And you should not, they say, stent uh, the doctor who has uh, uh, pulmonary artery stones in the vicinity of the ductal insertion. But again, that's the guidelines, and so there are some people who are doing it. And as, as I said before, if you put a stent into the stenotic site, the growth is pretty good, actually. So. When I'm talking about the lung and tortoise ductus, a ductus like this, you should never try to do a stent because you will not be able to get through that. But even if you, you, get, you can get through that, one stent is never going to be enough and you will need, and you will run into trouble, that's for sure. So you have to be careful to select which patients you should try or which patients you should try. This is from a recent paper from India, and it's very interesting. I haven't tried that yet, but see, it has a good ductal ampulla and has severe PA bifurcation stenosis, so they did a kissing stent like in the, in the coronary arteries. They have guide wires in both pulmonary arteries, and they, at the simultaneously, they inflated two stents, and the result actually looks very good. So that's against the guidelines, but the result is very good. So if you're brave enough, you have good surgeons back up, backing you up, I mean, that's something that's worth it, actually, to try. So in my personal opinion, PDA stenting in the uh, PDA-dependent pulmonary circulation is ideal when you need temporary patency of the patent ductus arteriosus until the right ventricle is able to support the pulmonary blood flow by itself, like the patients with critical PAs, IVS pulmonary atresia, and in functional pulmonary atresia neonatal Epstein's. And it also gives patients the opportunity to be cured by intervention alone. And, uh, it may serve as a bridging to bidirectional gland shunt in patients who are univentricular repair candidates with more than one source of pulmonary blood flow and anatomically favorable PDA for stenting. I think it's a good alternative for BT shunts in these patients also. And if you have, when you have non confident pulmonary arteries, bilateral PDAs, or one PA eight from an atypical ductus and other from the descending aorta, uh, who are not suitable for total correction at that time, you can buy time until definitive surgery uh, as an alternative to PT shunts, just to decrease the, type, the, the number of surgeries this patient is going to get. But we have to be careful with the stent stenosis, and if relatively long palliation is needed or in patients prior to gland operation performed as an alternative to surgical MBT shunts, PA growth should be monitored very closely. It is possible to redilate, as I mentioned, but it's definitely more difficult and risky compared to the first procedure. 
And in patients with elongated and tortuous PDS, especially with more than two turns or bends, need long-term palliation or need PA reconstruction, I think the surgery is the best way to go. Okay, now, quickly, I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the PDA-dependent systemic circulation, which is a hybrid approach for the Norwood operation, and we have, uh, actually, for the last one year, we are doing this in our institution, so we kind of knew, uh, and we are still learning, and I'm going to, you know, share my experiences with you. Um, the, as Dr. Sano mentioned, we can use this approach in hypoplastic left heart syndrome and variants with aortic atresia with, with, and with or without mitral stenosis and mitral atresia and the other congenital heart defects associated with left heart obstructed lesions. Uh, so you can have a wide variety of patients that you can use this, but uh, there's another uh, area that we frequently do this is the difficult in patients like yesterday was well pointed out in patients with difficult to predict the LV performance, like in aortic stenosis, critical aortic stenosis with EFEs, um, with the LV volume you know, close to 20 milliliters per square meter, and with mitral and aortic anal hypoplasia, so you, you don't know how this patient is going to behave. So you may do an initial um, uh, hybrid approach, so you can always have the op option for uh, bioventricular repair in the future in these patients. So that's a good, actually, alternative for that kind of patients, I believe. Um, you can do that in critical aortic stenosis, aortic partition, and in patients who has EFEs. Uh, what about if you have well developed two ventricles like intraperitoneal aorta? I think that's, uh, again, it depends on your surgeon's approach. If your surgeon feels very comfortable in the neonate and go to do the, uh, the whole heart surgery, that's okay, but if they don't feel comfortable in the neonatal and with the you know, circulatory arrest and stuff like that, so you can always do a hybrid approach in this patient. It's relatively easy for us because you're not obstructing any vessels, anything, so I think it's one of the you know, easiest ones for the cardiologist to perform. Um, and also in these patients, like very rare patients, which we had a couple of patients like this aortic atresia and VSTs, um, and also some other types of patients, you can use that. What we are trying to do, we are to try to continue the fetal circulation in this patient. So how do we do that? We need to increase the PVR, and we do that with bilateral PA bands, and then we need a non-restrictive PDA, and we do that with the PDA stent, and also we need a non-restrictive AST. We do septostomies, and most of the time, if that's not enough, we have to put a stent in the atrial septum as well. So why do we do it? Because the normal stage one mortality is high. Well, that's not the case maybe in in Japan or in, in maybe in Britain, but in our countries, we still are struggling with good results in, in terms of surgery. So um, I think prolonged cardiopulmonary bypass and total cardiac arrest in the new time period is, is, is not good. And um, as we all know, some centers publish similar or better short-term or long-term results compared to normal stage one in this, in this patient group. So. So who should we do it? That's a question everybody is actually asking, and nobody really knows. Should we do it in all Norwood candidates? Should we do it all, only in high-risk patients, like the low birth weight, prematurity, major extra cardiac anomalies, patients with good, with a bad preoperative condition, like a multi-organ failure, thrombocytopenia. So that's all discussed, but I mean, I think or we should never use it, we should all go for no. So that's a question, but I think that's all have to be tailored in terms of your institution's uh, resources and how your uh, surgeons uh, are feeling about Norwoods. And um, in our institution, the, we have started Norwood operations, but the results were not that great. So we said, well, let's try the hybrid approach and see. And, Initially, we had troubles with the hybrid approach also, but nowadays it's, it's pretty straightforward and, uh, I, I, and the results are definitely better compared to normal stage one operations, at least in our center. So I think it depends on your experience and your resources and everybody has to be tailored this according to their resources. The most important problem here is the reverse coarctation as mentioned earlier. That's, that's a major problem because that, that influences the cerebral perfusion and the coronary perfusion and the patients, when they got fuzzy and everything looks good, when they cry and then they just drop that, you know, that, that's, I mean, if the patient, even if the patient looks good, you can send them home, 
and the mother calls you, he's been crying for an hour, and then when they come into the ER, they're usually in shock, and, you know, you cannot do much about it. So that's very important, and you have to be very uh, aware of this, and you have to be very careful about that. And there is a definite interstage morbidity and mortality, and there's difficult, definitely difficulties in comprehensive stage two procedure as well. It's not a simple operation as I have been in the operating room watching the surgeon. So uh, there, there are two ways to do it, actually. It's a single session like they did in Columbus, Ohio, that they do it in the operating room usually. The surgeon opens the chest, puts uh, a purse string, and they put a, a cannula into the RV, OT, into the PA. And as you can see here, you can do the stenting and everything from here, and, all, and the surgeon also does the PA bands at the same session. Uh, well, if you don't have a hybrid lab, like in my center, we, what we do in the operating room, we usually have the C arm with us, but you don't have the best pictures maybe, but it is possible to do it in the operating room with the C arm also. Um, I only do that in patients who don't respond to prostaglandin. I mean, there are a couple of patients that you, even if you give high dose of prostaglandin, the doctors are very restricted, and that patients, you, don't, you cannot wait. It, as soon as they put the bands in, you go in and you put the doctor. But that's very rare in, in my experience. So. As I said, the ductus is different. It's, you, we're usually dealing with large ductuses here, and the morphology is also different. But again, the problem here is that you're going to be covering the, the, the transverse arch, which you call, or the isthmus part of the arch. So that might be a problem. So you can use either balloon expandable or set expandable stents. And if you have a little bit of a stenosis, I prefer to use balloon expendables. If you don't have stenosis, I prefer to use the self expendables. This is a patient with, we have done in two sessions. The PA bands were done like a day before. The patients are usually extubated. They're coming to the uh, operate, I mean the, the cat lab. And we just go from the transvenous road. We put the stent in. That's a balloon expendable stent. And you see. The PA is also. And the patients are actually, as I said, and they usually stay really, really less in the hospital. So this is a self expendable stent with a very large ductus. And uh, this is, see, here you can see that there is going to be a problem with the, trans with, the, with the arch in this patient. So this patient, we missed that initially. I mean, we, now I'm looking at it and we sh I should have done something in, at that time of the uh, procedure for the retrograde coarctation. But here, in echo, it looked quite well, and there was no uh, turbulent flow in the ACE, and these are the PA bands, where there was no turbulent flow in the ACE and the aorta. So I was happy, and I thought, I, I, I didn't think there was going to be a problem, because you see the laminar flow, retrograde flow in the ACE and the aorta. But when these patients get fuzzy and stuff, that's, that's a problem that we know. So that was another patient where we had a retrograde coarctation. The patient had a right atrial um, monitoring, right, atri right arterial, uh, radial artery monitor, and the, PA and the pressure from the right arm was 25 over 18, and the, in the catheter, in the descending aorta, or in the PA, the pressure was 75 over 30. So there were clearly a, a gradient here. As you can see, there was, uh, stenosis over there. So what we did, we put a stent in there first. And also this patient needed a natural stent, as you can see the stent down. And eventually we did this. So that, that's something you have, to, you have to take care during the first initial uh, the procedure. And as you see, the right arm pressures went up to 80s and the leg was like 90s. So there was still a little bit of a gradient, but that was definitely better compared to the previous one. So that's the main problem and we have to deal with that. So the equipment, I don't think you need to know about that much, so you can go as an anti-grade or transarterial, whatever, but um, you, heparin is important, and you have to give these patients heparin during the procedure, and also at least 24 hours afterwards, and then you need to give anti treatment uh, after that. Again, when to stop the PG infusion in these patients, if if the ductuses are too large, it can, that can be a problem for the stent migration. But again, as I say, I usually don't uh, fully stop the prostaglandin infusion. I just drop the dose 
Uh, sometimes if they really look huge and then I stop the prostaglandin in the cat lab, why am I waiting there for another half an hour or so and wait until some stenosis occurs? So. Um, there are still issues that you can discuss, but uh, as I said, we do it in uh, consecutive sessions. We like it better. The, the, the surgeon does the PA band when the patient comes into the hospital, and the next day or two, we go in and we do the PDA stenting. Uh, because for the PA band, the patient needs to be intubated, but afterwards, we usually extubate the patient and take the patient to the cat lab, and the patient is extubated. I like it that way. Because as you know, manipulations during the uh, intubated patient, when they overinflate and, and the anesthesiologist may just uh, decrease carb and that makes trouble with the vital conductors. As Dr. Sano mentioned out, you may have decreased diastolic pressures, and you may have coronary perfusion problems. So I usually need, like the patients extubated. And if, they, if there is any question about the atrial septum, you have to stent the atrial septum that time because it's also very important. So ductal stenting is a safe and effective procedure in patients in whom the systemic circulation is totally or partially dependent on the PDA. Uh, should we do it just we can do it? That's a question to discuss. As I said, that depends on your resources and your, your institution. And in, way, in which patient, again, that's, that's again up to you, to your resources. So, but still, the patient selection and techniques are still discussing, and uh, we are still discussing these. Uh, we do all comers right now, but you know, in most centers, only the high, high risk patients are done. So, I don't think that's fair because if you only do the high risk patients, then your results are definitely going to be worse compared to the better ones. So, so I'm going to finish here with Charles Smallin saying that an interventional cardiologist spends his or her training to learn which patient to intervene, and then spends his or or her carrier to learn which patient not to intervene. So that's, I think, the most important thing, that we should know which patients not to intervene.